You want to see a weird and somewhat crazy German guy show you how to make the strongest steel gas in the world? Well, you came to the right place. Today, I will show you how to make CS. CS is another name for a chemical called 2 chlorobenzyl number nitrile and I will tell you where the completely unrelated name CS stems from later in the video. The chemical structure of CS looks like this and it's rather interesting. Another interesting fact about the tear gas CS is that it's actually not a gas, but a white powder as you can see here. That's a nice white powder. You may desire to know why I want to make tear gas in the first place, and the answer may surprise you. I have made several tear gases in the past, like benzyl chloride, bromoacetone, and benzyl bromide. And I am likely the only person in the world to say this, but I was kind of disappointed by that. And because of that, I am going to show you how to make the strongest tear gas in the world and on top of that, even how to make the catalyst for it because I don't have the real catalyst here. The original paper uses piperidine as a catalytic base. But our pathetic government does not make it easy for people to buy piperidine. So instead of making piperidine myself, which would be possible, we will go a different route. Nucocarbon of the ring and you are left with a slightly uglier molecule called pyrrolidine that works just as well. Pyrrolidine has an absolutely horrendous smell and it can easily be made from an amino acid with an equally nasty taste. Synthesizing the catalyst for making tear gas is really easy. All you need is proline, acetophenone and way too much free time. Exact amounts don't matter here, eyeballing the chemicals would probably be enough. This reaction will need to be heated. To keep the liquids from escaping, you therefore need a reflux condenser. At some point the reaction mixture will look like sh** and a rapid gas evolution takes place. The gas can easily kill fire. I'm sure you know what gas this could be, but let's take a look into the reaction mechanism to confirm. I tried to figure out the mechanism for 3 hours, but unfortunately failed and everything seemed unreasonable. I am however absolutely sure that it goes via enamine formation. The reaction itself is a decarboxylation meaning carbon dioxide is split off. Acetophenone is required as a catalyst and as a high boiling solvent at the same time. By the way, if you happen to know anything about this reaction, please let me know. I can't rest peacefully otherwise. Three hours in, the gas evolution stopped. I turned off the heating and let it cool down. Isolating our stinky friend is not hard. Fractionally distill and you leave behind a crap ton of terry black stuff. The resulting liquid may be clear but you can only call it pure if you squint your eyes hard enough. Traces of acetophenone remain behind and over the course of a week it even turned orange. If you want pure product a simple distillation will suffice. But beware of the horrific smell. Our first indicator of purity is that the boiling point matches the theoretical one. In the end, 122.3 grams of nasty were obtained. This represents an 85.3% yield. I measured the refractive index and it was way too high, which means that it's still impure. For our purposes, however, this should be pure enough. In comparison to bases like piperidine or even pyridine, pyrrolidine has one truly disgusting smell. It smells like the room of some 14-year-old depressed teenager. And I know that you want to see me smelling it, and therefore I'm going to do it. Mmm! That stings in the nose. Maybe a little more dilute. Truly disgusting. <sighs> Why am I even doing this? For the actual synthesis, four chemicals are needed. Malonitrile, 2 chlorobenzaldehydes, methanol and our favorite disgusting amine. The malonitrile chunk is too small to be easily removed from the bottle. Fortunately, you can melt it on low heat to get it out. Malonitrile has a melting point of 36 degrees C and you want to heat it carefully. When you heat it too much, you will get a wild mix of hydrogen cyanide and other gases that your body is not going to enjoy. Now it's time for the German guy to have fun. For the reaction you will need one average sized flask and a stirfish. 115 grams of malonitrile are then drained directly into the tiny flask. As it hits the glass it instantly solidifies and turns into a white like substance. We then continue by adding 400 grams of wood alcohol as a solvent. 
With the help of a clean and totally not etched measuring cylinder, 250 grams of 2 chlorobenzaldehyde are weighed out and diluted with 200 grams of methanol. Swirl the cylinder and combine the solutions. To get out the last drop of 2 chlorobenzaldehyde, it should be washed with 200 grams of methyl alcohol and this brings us to a total of 800 grams. Our small flask has one neck and to attach thermometer and reflux condenser we need at least two. Fortunately for us you can easily improvise if you have the right glassware and this is what I did. Using a condenser is likely overkill but I used it anyways. When you don't know what the reaction is going to do but can already foresee avoidable risks, deal with them before they happen. Turn on the steering, lean back and just wait for something to happen. What ended up happening was that an enormous amount of white sludge crashed out after only 3 minutes. This is our product. For driving the reaction to completion, you turn on the heating mantle, heat to 53 degrees C to create a tornado of unbelievable pain. Today's reaction is known as the knoen fagel condensation. Chlorobenzaldehyde and malonitrile react with a base as a catalyst to form CS and water. Regarding the mechanism, our malonitrile is deprotonated in the first step and then attacks the carbon of our aldehyde. The former aldehyde oxygen is protonated and you get back the catalytic base pyrrolidine. Another deprotonation and protonation take place and we are left with an excellent leaving group OH2+. Electrons are moved around, the leaving group leaves, water is split off and you are finally left with baby powder. Proceed by turning off the heating mantle and set a timer to exactly one hour. So anyways, it looked like not a lot happened and therefore I decided to give up, uh, I mean continue. During the cooling process we got these hot needle like crystals and now we need to remove the solvent from the product. And to remove the solvent, a small vacuum filtration setup like this is ideal. By the way, if you're wondering where the name CS stems from, it's not from the chlorine in the molecule and the letter S that magically appeared, but from the creator's names, Corsen and Stoden. Rinsing the flask is ideally done by reusing the saturated methanol solution and not fresh solvent. By doing it this way, you avoid losing precious product. Swirl the flask, filter, wash the first batch with hydroxymethane to remove excess base and then dry it using a vacuum. Anyways, as the filter is full enough, I will put the first batch into this massive deformed beaker. But look at this, look at this nice beautiful white powder. I'm so happy how well this worked. Wikipedia says handling the wet powder is okay and I have to agree on that. If the dry powder is disastrous, we are going to see later. For the second batch, I went through the exact same process like for the first one. Filter, rinse, vacuum, wash and then suck it dry. No matter how good you are as a chemist, some solvent will stay behind and no level of degeneracy is going to scare it out of your product. If I can scare the solvent away, leftover methane hydroxide will be removed in a vacuum chamber by putting it over anhydrous calcium chloride. Two days later the product was dry but it was a little bit yellow at the top. That's my fault and it happened because I did not clean out the chamber and still had something interesting sticking to the walls. And there you go, here's your finished tear gas. You guys are probably wondering what this tear gas smells like in its solid form because I'm not wearing a gas mask right now and like this, it's not that bad. Like this, it smells somewhat pepper-like but it doesn't have a very strong smell. When messing around with the solid tear gas, we are going to get particles in the air. And they are going to be tear inducing. Therefore, I will be wearing one of these. Continue by scraping the perfectly white powder onto a piece of paper using a spoon and then transfer it to a pre-weighed fancy storage bottle. By the way, there's a special reason I am using an aluminium and not a plastic bottle. That reason is impossible to guess, so let me reveal it. I prefer the look of it. Yep, that's it. The elegant look of the white gold complements the painful beauty of our product. We ended up with 309.7 grams of CS and this represents yields of 94.3%. And now that we know the yields, this brings me back to the question of how bad handling the dry dust actually is. 
it's actually not as bad as I thought it would be. I guess there are not that many particles in the air, but it's not that bad. What I would normally have thrown away as waste ended up growing mesmerizing crystals. Just like sharks smell blood, a chemist smells an increase in yield here. We won't get much, but I was too lazy to calculate how much would be left. To get more products, you need to get rid of solvents, but not all solvents, as there's excess chlorobenzaldehyde. We will therefore need to find a middle ground and distill until my mind rationally or irrationally decides that it looks good. I am not going to reuse the recovered methanol, instead I will burn it because it's healthy to indulge in your dark side every once in a while. <laughs> to get crystals the flask was cooled down and after filtration I used hydrogen methyl ether to rinse them. We gained an additional 24.7 grams of product, which makes me the best chemist in the world. We created matter from nothing and ended up with a 102% yield. Take them off! Let's go! Take it off! Put them inside! Pull them up! Put them inside the carrier! Put them inside the carrier! I am now going to give you some theory, but you should under no circumstances recreate any of this and I am also not going to do it myself. All of this is freely available, non-classified information, but I still have to tell you not to make any tear gas dispersionary device because you don't want to get into legal trouble over a stupid hobby. Instead of making the tear gas myself, which I could do and it would be legal for me, but I am still not going to do it because I want to avoid possible trouble, I am going to buy a commercially available cylinder and do a test with that. In pepper spray your active component is dissolved in a volatile solvent like acetone or DCM and that solution is put into a pressurized can. Police and military also have another option. They have a mix of CS with a special mixture of oxidizing agent and reducing agent that I'm not going to name and it burns slowly enough to evaporate the CS without destroying it. The last version is often encountered in home defense. It uses a siliconized form of CS in a plastic ball that can be shot out of something similar to a paintball pew pew. Raw CS powder would clump up and be ineffective. It must thus be mixed with a special ingredient. When ground together with this light powder it is not going to clump up and handling it in this form really is disastrous without a gas mask. Although it would be legal for me to make my own tear gas under specific circumstances, I'm just going to go down to the weapons shop and buy some. Fortunately the store sells CS gas and this canister contains 80 milligrams of it. This means that with the amount of tear gas that we made, we could in theory make 4180 of these canisters. There you go, we got some CS gas. We are in the forest at night and there's definitely nothing suspicious going on here. I'm wearing the skirt and yeah, let's get weird. Running away from it, it's getting a little. <coughs> it's, it's very bad. That shit is crazy. <coughs> it stopped. You see that mist? <coughs> Press it down, place it down here, and the frog is going here, staying a little low to the ground. <coughs> yes, <laughs> you can see that the tear gas is <coughs> it's definitely working. It's not a good feeling with the tear gas, but at least it's a feeling. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to like and subscribe. But I have to get out of here. Bye. Before breaking it off, I would like to thank all of my Patreons because without you guys, 
I would not have been able to produce another one of these weird messed up videos. So thanks for that and see you guys next time. Bye.